is Brianna Walker and I am with the Union County Wildlife Chapter. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, our pre presenter tonight is doc Dr. Matthew Godfrey. Um, he is a biologist with the North Carolina Resources Commission and helps coordinate this NCC Turtle Project. Um, he's also an adjunct faculty at the College of Veterinary Medicine at NCSU um, and the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. So with that being said, I will turn it over to Dr. Godfrey. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thanks for letting me speak about sea turtles to everybody. And I'll just share my screen. Uh, hopefully I can get that started. So yeah, so I, I have the I'm lucky to have the job of working with sea turtles every day, uh, and I've, I've had this job in North Carolina since 2002. Uh, and I'm, I feel, every day, pretty much, I feel lucky to have it. So just uh, I'd just like to start off and remind everybody that there are seven species of sea turtles worldwide um, currently. Uh, they, they fall into two families, either the hard shell turtles or the soft shell or the leatherback, shirt, leatherback shell turtles, the Dermochelidae. Um, so six are hard shells, one is a leatherback, and there are two that are very closely related, the Kemp's Ridley and the Olive Ridley. Um, so of these seven, we actually have five of the seven that occur in North Carolina. We have the loggerhead, green turtle, Kemp's Ridley, and Hawksbill. These are all hard shell turtles, and you can tell from their, their typical sea turtle hard carapace um, and then we also have leatherbacks that occur here, and they have uh, softer, they, they have bony carapaces, but they're more flexible. Um, they don't have large plates of bones. They actually have a very small mosaic. Uh, make, it's made up of a mosaic of small bones um, that is covered by leathery skin, and that's, that's why they're called the leatherback. We also have a, uh, an honorary semi-marine turtle the diamondback terrapin. Um, we say it's semi-marine because it can be found in uh, almost fully fresh um, salt water, uh, sorry, fully salt water, um, but it tends to remain mostly in brackish water. Um, actually, there, there are probably 70, up to 70 species that we know about of so-called freshwater or land turtles that can withstand some salinity, um, but they're not really sea turtles in and of themselves. I just wanted to point out that we also have this semi-marine turtle in North Carolina. Uh, and there's a whole separate project um, that's been set up through my agency to try to monitor and conserve um, these diamondback terrapins as well. So back to sea turtles. Sea turtles are here in North Carolina primarily for two reasons, either to reproduce, to lay eggs, or to forage. We have pretty good foraging habitat for them. There's actually a third reason too. They might just be transiting through uh, during their migration. So for instance, um, leatherbacks commonly migrate north in the summer uh, to Atlantic Canada to forage on jellyfish there, uh, and they'll pass through relatively quickly our, our ocean waters. They won't really hang out. Um, and some of the other species might do that as well, but we also have pop resident populations that come for certain times, uh, certain months of year, either to reproduce or to forage. Now, all sea turtle species are protected by the Endangered Species Act, the federal, um, federal law that protects uh, threatened species. So for the five that occur in North Carolina, the loggerhead, green, Kemp's Ridley, leatherback, and hawksbill, they're all listed um, either as a species. So for instance, the Kemp's Ridley is listed as a species, the leatherback is listed as a species, and the hawksbill is listed as a species. And all are considered endangered, which means that um, it's they're in danger of going extinct in the near future. The loggerhead and the green turtle are actually listed as DPSs or distinct population segments. You can think of them as subpopulations. So the Northwest Atlantic loggerhead subpopulation and the North Atlantic green turtle population are listed as threatened, which still gives them protection, but it just means that they're likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future. Um, their, their level of threat is not as great as endangered, but it's, it seems like they're on their way to becoming endangered. So all of them are protected by federal law. And the Endangered Species Act, of course, prohibits take of any listed um, species that are either listed as threatened or endangered. And take is broadly um, defined as anything that can harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, 
uh, basically anything that disturbs um, uh, the animal they are protected from. And of course, uh, if, if a species or a distinct population segment is listed under the Endangered Species Act, there should be a recovery plan for that species or population that is a blueprint for how to get that species off the endangered species list. So for instance, there's a recovery plan for the Northwest Atlantic population of loggerhead sea turtles that lays out criteria um, that have to be met by which the, the subpopulation can be downlisted or taken off the Endangered Species Act. Now, uh, the Endangered Species Act is a federal rule, a federal law, um, and interestingly, um, because sea turtles occur both on the land, so when they're nesting or when their eggs are, are incubating or when hatchlings are leaving the nest and scrambling to the water, um, or they're in the water doing their thing because they are marine turtles, um, because they're, they occur both land and water, they are shared by their shared responsibility of two federal agencies. So when they're on land, the Fish and Wildlife Service is responsible for them. And when they're in the water, the National Marine Fisheries Service or NOAA Fisheries is responsible for them. And these two agencies have a memorandum of, of understanding um, that allows them to jointly manage them together, especially when it gets a little bit fuzzy when turtles are sort of in the swash zone. Um, it's not always clear who's responsible right at that moment. The Endangered Species Act has an interesting um, section, section six, uh, which says that if the federal government can, it should work closely with the states to um, achieve conservation activities. So because of that, the Fish and Wildlife Service has a cooperative agreement with my agency at the state level, the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission for sea turtles. And it also has a cooperative agreement we also have a cooperative agreement with the National Marine Fisheries Service or NOAA Fisheries for sea turtles in the water. So essentially the, the federal government um, through these cooperative agreements is empowering the states to conserve and protect uh, what, what are federally protected species. So if you, the way it works uh, more specifically is that we have this cooperative agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service. We also have a joint enforcement agreement, which allows our law enforcement agents to uh, enforce both state and federal rules. And as long as we um, follow everything that's laid out in the recovery plan, pretty much we, we can manage and conserve sea turtles as they occur on the land. Um, so that's nesting females, eggs, hatchlings, and when turtles are in captivity, either at the aquariums for educational purposes or rehab centers when turtles are sick or injured and getting getting rehabbed before they're released. Um, that also falls under the um, auspices of the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Nash, uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. For sea turtles in the water, we have a cooperative agreement with the National Marine Fisheries Service it's a little bit different though. It's not quite as broad. Uh, one of the big differences is we don't have an, a joint enforcement ag agreement with the federal agency. So our um, wildlife uh, enforcement officers are not, allow not able to enforce federal rules, federal laws for um, protected species that National Marine Fisheries Service is responsible for. So we can't do that. It's actually the National Marine Fisheries Service um, themselves have their own law enforcement people that are responsible for enforcing their any violations and also they rely on the Coast Guard to help out enforce those um, any violations. Another big difference is that instead of um, being able to manage all turtles in the waters at all times, our cooperative agreement actually just lets us manage stranded turtles and by stranded turtles, oops I'm just going to go back, by stranded turtles, I mean, we mean that turtles that are sick, um, injured, dead, or otherwise incapacitated that end up um, stranding on land. Um, so if they if they end up beaching on the on the beach or on the on a marsh somewhere, then we are um, through our cooperative agreement um, empowered to go and to manage those to respond to them um, and deal with them. We are not, through this cooperative agreement, we are not allowed to manage things like fisheries or any kind of uh, other operations that might be occurring in the water that may 
um, injure or harm sea turtles. So that that's a big difference between um, our cooperative agreement for uh, with the National Marine Fishery Service versus um, Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, at the state level, through our cooperative agreements with the federal government, we um, manage sea turtles through our sea turtle project, and it has two main uh, um, parts to it. One is nest monitoring and protection, and the other is the stranding network. So the nest monitoring, our goals are to monitor and protect all nesting sea turtles, all eggs, all hatchlings. And for the stranding network, as I said, we respond to um, any dead, sick, or injured sea turtles that occur um, on our shoreline. And the data that we collect, we use for um, assessing whether or not the species is uh, has met recovery criteria as laid out by those recovery plans. And we also use it for technical guidance, which just means that um, say someone wants to construct a new uh, hotel on the beach and they'll ask, you know, what's the best way to do it to minimize impact on sea turtles? We can provide information about that. Um, and that, that's what I mean by technical guidance. And that, and that can be for a variety of activities um, that occur on the coast. Um, now I, I work, uh, I'm full-time employed by the Wildlife Resources Commission, but I'm just one biologist and we have pretty big states. So we actually rely on a huge network of people um, to help us. Uh, that includes the public, um, the Coast Guard, uh, federal agencies, private citizens, uh, visitors, uh, state, state uh, other state agencies, other local agencies, NGOs, everybody. Um, who occurs, who is there on the coast, uh, we ask and, and count on to help us out to try to, to monitor, respond to, and protect sea turtles. So it's, it's really a huge network of cooperators and volunteers in North Carolina. It's kind of hard to keep count because uh, people come and go, but it's somewhere around 2,500 to 3,000 people at any one time are, are working with us, actively working with us to try to try to collect information, protect turtles, respond to stranded turtles, things like that. So in terms of sea turtle nest monitoring, um, we, we're pretty lucky in North Carolina. We have about 500 kilometers or 330 miles of sandy ocean coastline. This is a picture of, of Emerald Isle Beach uh, in Carteret County down near where I live. Um, and it's pretty typical nesting habitat for sea turtles, wide open space. And uh, it looks pretty much like this from the South Carolina line all the way up to the Virginia line. And anywhere there's this good habitat, uh, turtles will, can and will nest. Um, so we have nesting that occurs pretty much everywhere along the state. And again, we rely heavily on, on cooperators with other, who work for other agencies or groups or volunteers who th every day through May and August, they go out uh, and walk the beach early in the morning. Uh, nearly all sea turtles nest at night. Um, and so the, to be able to find where they lay their eggs, you walk first thing in the morning. And, and fortunately, turtles are big, sea turtles are big, so you can see clearly the, the crawl on the sand. Um, and, and the volunteers and the cooperators like to go early because at, before the beach visitors get out there and accidentally trample those uh, crawls. So they can visualize them and then verify that there are eggs there. Um, sea turtles that come out at night um, and crawl up on the beach don't always lay eggs. And we want to be sure that if we're going to mark off an area for protection to keep people out of that area, that there are actually eggs there. So we ask the volunteers and the cooperators to, to verify, verify that the eggs are there. And that's what these people are doing. And again, it, it occurs uh, on municipal beaches, on, on federal lands. So these are these are rangers with the National Park Service in Cape Hatteras. And you can see very clearly um, in the morning that it's it's easy to find those tracks as long as people haven't walked over them. Um, and state parks as well. Uh, Marine Corps Base in Camp Lejeune helps us. NGOs, Bald Head Island Conservancy, Audubon, um, they're all active as well on their properties, their islands. And then uh, once nests are marked, uh, the volunteers or cooperators will, will monitor them during the incubation period, which is about 50 to 60 days, depending on temperature. And when it gets close to time of emergence, they'll build uh, these special runways, which um, 
I mean, we, they, they say it's to help the hatchlings get down to the ocean, um, but actually it's more to keep people back and not trample on um, on the sand and, and possibly interrupt the, the progress of hatchlings from the nest to the water. So if you ever see anything like this on the beach, it means that that nest is getting, it's, it's around the time of expected emergence. And then after the hatchlings emerge, which also occurs at night usually, um, the volunteers wait three days, 72 hours, and then they'll go in and check on the success of the nest. They'll do an inventory, count how many uh, empty eggshells there are versus unhatched eggs. Um, and they usually do this in the late afternoon, which is a good opportunity for public outreach and, and raising awareness about sea turtles. And, and it tends to be pretty popular. Um, and those data are important components. Knowing the success, the hatching success of those nests is an important um, component of uh, doing recovery assessment. These can be really popular events. So I just took this picture a couple of years ago, um, pre-COVID clearly, uh, on, on Bald Head Island. Uh, and it wasn't, it, it, the, the, um, the interns working there in the summer, uh, had, they didn't know that, um, that the nest had, it was a wild nest that they hadn't marked, a surprise nest. So they were doing the inventory and, and they hadn't announced anything. And these people just happened to be walking by. And so you can get hundreds, several hundreds of people um, crowding around watching a, a nest excavation at any time um, on the state, which which is a great opportunity again for raising awareness and spreading spreading information about sea turtle conservation. This just shows you, this graph is uh, just shows you the seasonality of when lay, nests are laid and when hatchlings emerge in the state. So this is for 2020. You know, our first nest was um, actually in, in early May, although, you know, there is some nesting in May, but it really ramps up in June, um, peaks sometime late June, early July, and then drops off towards the end of the summer. We, we get a few nests laid here and there. Uh, what's covered up here is there actually was a nest laid on Cape Hatteras on the 31st of October, which which is fairly rare. It sometimes happens, um, but it was pretty. It, it is a rare occurrence to have a nest that late. It's mostly in uh, June and July that most nests are laid, and then 50 to 60 days later, you start to see hatchling emergences occur, um, and so they they ramp up in in August through the end of August into September. Um, I don't know if you can see right around 4th of August that there was a drop in the hatching hat, number of nests that hatchlings emerged from and also a drop in the number of nests laid. That was actually Hurricane Isaias that occurred, um, which struck uh, Brunswick County and actually, uh, actually probably destroyed about 300 nests in Brunswick County. Um, and we didn't record any nests the following day. It's it's not clear if no turtles nested or we just weren't able to see um, the tracks from the turtles because there was so much um, storminess and the and the waves might have covered up the tracks. But that that just shows that we do get weather events that do sometimes impact um, turtles. I think we had another tropical storm that may have occurred around this time as well um, that it impacted hatchling emergencies. This graph just shows you uh, the number of nests laid per year in North Carolina by loggerhead sea turtles. I, I should have said that most of our nests are laid by loggerhead turtles. We, we get a handful of green turtle nests and Kemp's Ridley nests every year, and even more rarely leatherback nests, and extremely rarely we'll get um, hawksbill nests. But it's mostly loggerhead nests. More than 95% of the nests laid in the state are by loggerheads. And you can see that um, there's a lot of up and down um, um, totals that occur over time. Uh, th this uh, graph starts in 1996, which is about the time, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's about the time we, ha we, had, we instituted statewide monitoring in a standardized manner. Um, and you can see it looked like that, um, well, first I should say this up and down pattern is pretty typical of sea turtle population. Um, because not all females nest in any particular year. So if you have a year where a lot of turtles nest, a lot of females nest, it's unlikely that they're going to come back to nest the following year. So you'll get a smaller proportion of females within the population nesting subsequently. 
So you'll see this up and down quite frequently in sea turtle populations. But uh, when I first started in 2002, there was it seemed like there was a downward trend and there was great concern that loggerhead um, turtles were, were in trouble, at least based on nesting numbers. Uh, this this kind of this downward pattern um, from the late 90s through 2004 or five um, was also seen in other states as well in the southeast. And then since then, it's sort of it looks like it's been picking up. Of course, you get a few down years. That's probably related to the fact that there were lots of turtles nesting the previous year. And it does look like there's an increase over time. We, we had a spectacular year in 2019 with more than 2,000 nests, which, which is great. The, the overall average is about 1,000 nests a year. And, and even though 2020 um, looks like we had a low year, actually it's, it's the third highest nest number on record for loggerhead turtles. Um, was 2020, so it was a pretty good year. Now, that being said, we, we still have threats that occur um, in North Carolina to sea turtles on land. Um, you know, one, one in particular that jumps out is beach driving. Um, beach driving occurs in various places at different times of year. This is a picture of um, a 4th of July weekend on Freeman Park, uh, which is north of Carolina Beach in New Hanover County. And they're allowed to drive 24-7 um, there. And it's it's good nesting habitat for sea turtles. But you can see by having all those cars there right by the high tide line, that blocks access for them. Um, we also There's also beach driving that occurs um, year round in parts of Cape Hatteras, Cape Lookout, um, north of Kerala, um, where Highway 12 ends. There's 24-7 driving up that way. Um, and then some of the islands also allow driving after the summer, you know, in the early fall, late summer. That can that can have impacts on hatchlings and incubating eggs that are still there. So places like Bogue Banks, where I am, Nags Head, Kill Devil Hills, uh, those areas also allow beach driving at times when there are still eggs and hatchlings. Eggs and hatchlings are on the beach. So of course, if there's if there or people driving at night and turtles trying to nest at night, you can have interactions that can be damaging. So th this is a picture here of a, of a loggerhead turtle trying to nest um, up by north of Kerala. Fortunately, the people driving saw her and stopped uh, and took this picture. Um, that's how we knew about it. But, um, you know, one of the concerns is that she she, she might have been hit or um, she might have finished nesting, left, and then the people driving didn't know what a nest looked like and driven over it, um, effaced the crawl, and then our volunteers that go out in the morning wouldn't have been able to find it, and then people would have continued to drive over it, and that would have destroyed the eggs. Uh, this turtle here, unfortunately, um, was uh, in, accidentally hit uh, in, in Cape Hatteras um, in 2020. Um, it actually, um, it occurred on the 25th of uh, May last year. Um, at that time, it, from May onwards, people are not allowed to drive at night on the beach. So someone was driving illegally. Uh, they probably had their lights off and they, that's why they didn't see it. And they, they hit the turtle um, and then left the scene. I don't think anybody was, anybody's been found who did it. Um, but the rangers found the turtle the next day. Um, she, she hadn't laid eggs yet, so they, um, they did a necropsy. They took the, the unlaid eggs out and put them in, a, in an artificially constructed uh, egg ca uh, nest cavity. Uh, and actually, I think they got 40 or 50 percent hatch success on those eggs from that turtle. But this is the kind of thing that we, we desperately want to avoid is, you know, these, these reproductive females that are um, very valuable to the population. We don't want to see them um, be injured like this that needlessly. And here, here's an example from Freedom Park where um, there had been a nest that the volunteers didn't know about. And the reason they didn't know about it is because the people driving uh, all the time there had run over the tracks. And so the volunteers couldn't find the eggs. And they only found them after there had been a storm event that opened up, uh, exposed the egg, the, the nest cavity. Um, and then birds came and picked, um, seagulls came and destroyed the, the remaining eggs there. So, you know, that's, Another unfortunate occurrence, had the volunteers been able to see the tracks, they would have been able to find the eggs, protect them, keep people away, and, and 
potentially save them and and had hatchlings come out of that nest. So again, it's you know it's something like we try to we'd want to avoid um, is needlessly losing sea turtle nests as well. Um, there's also you know loss of habitat uh, that we're concerned about due to things like um, people put sandbags in front of their homes to try to protect them from encroaching water through because of erosion. So th where these sandbags are in front of this house, this would be nesting habitat for sea turtles, but clearly the turtles can't access the sand there. They can't lay their eggs on top of the sandbags, so they've been blocked from that access. Um, but other things can do that as well. Beach furniture, construction materials. Someone is building, say, um, a big deck on their house and they're, they leave all the material on the beach as they're constructing and it takes them several weeks. Uh, the material that's on the beach is blocking access of the turtles to get to, to get to the sand to lay eggs. And Christmas trees. Now I'll show you some examples of some of these. So here, here's construction on a beach. This is beach nourishment that is that occurs fairly regularly in our state. Um, in the past, it's it's mostly been restricted to uh, winter months when turtles are not here, when eggs are not incubating, when turtles are not trying to nest. Um, but more recently, uh, there have been changes in some of the management of of nourishment activities, and and there's more nourishment in the summer. So this is a picture from Wrightsville Beach, which is good nesting habitat. And you can see these big pipes are lying on the beach parallel to the to the water line. And basically they would block or they do block access of the female, any nesting females that come out of the water to try to get to this area behind the pipes, which is good nesting habitat. They can't get there because those pipes are in the way. So that that's definitely a concern that we have. Um, and and sometimes turtles still manage to get through. They either crawl over a ramp or something like that, and they might get stuck. So this this is a nesting female on Baldhead Island. When Baldhead Island was constructing a, a terminal groin a couple years ago, they they did that construction work in the summer. And even though they hired um, um, professional monitors to go out every day, every night to look for sea turtles and make sure that they stayed away from the construction area. This one still snuck in and was only found by a bulldozer operator who, who happened to see her when he was um, pushing sand around. Um, at midday, she was stuck. She had been stuck there for about 10 hours, we think. Um, and she could have, well, we're actually not sure what, have, what would have happened if she had stayed there the whole day. Um, fortunately, they, they called the right people um, they were able to take her back to the water, uh, and she did come back and nest two two weeks later. Um, so, so she did. We do know she survived at least um, that event. She came back at least once from then. Uh, I said Christmas trees because there there's um, increasing interest by people to use old Christmas trees uh, as a, a potential sand capture method for. Um, helping beaches stay beaches. So instead of sand fences, people have been trying to use um, old Christmas trees to catch sand as it's blowing in the wind. And you can see that depending on how the trees are placed, that can either be a good thing or bad thing for sea turtles. So on the, on the left side, this is a picture from Nags Head last year, um, last winter, and you can see that people brought Christmas trees to the beach and tied them to sand fencing, um, I guess to increase the efficacy of sand fencing. But what happened is, is that the trees in between the sand fencing essentially blocked all access of turtles to get behind the sand fencing, which is where they would go to nest. And then this picture is, a, is from North Topsail Beach in um, in the central part of the state, and the trees have been lined up um, head to toe in a solid line that's parallel to the water, um, just at the high tide line, right where the turtles would normally nest. So again, this, I think the intention was good, it's just that they were placed in an inappropriate way. And, and at the state level, the Division of Coastal Management does have guidelines for placing Christmas trees on beaches for the purposes of catching sand, and they recommend that they're placed in a manner similar to sand fencing to minimize impacts to sea turtles. So in both these cases, um, we contacted the Division of Coastal Management to, to ask them to work with the, uh, the towns 
to try to rectify this situation. But again, you know, our concern is that we don't want to block access to nesting habitat. We want to avoid having anything that blocks access to nesting habitat. Another big threat to sea turtles on land is artificial light at night. Um, as I said, sea turtles nest mostly at night and the hatchlings mostly come out at night and they're very, very visual creatures. They rely on vision to be able to return to the water on a natural nesting beach. Um, the horizon over the water is always brighter than the horizon over the land, whether or not there's a moon there, uh, whether or not there are clouds, it's always the case that it's brighter um, over, the over the sea than the landward side, except when you have artificial lights. So this is a, this is a pier house, again, Wrightsville Beach. This is the Johnny Mercer Pier. These are quite bright lights. Um, and in fact, turtles can and have been attracted to them thinking that that is the uh, ocean horizon, but it's not. And we have several um, examples of hatchlings uh, crawling up and just remaining underneath, stuck underneath the, the pier house, trying to get to the water, not sure, not sure what's going on. So that's something that we try to work with. Uh, this pier owner in particular, we, we met several times to talk about ways to minimize um, lighting, visible lighting to sea turtles. Uh, here's another example. This is up on, on Hatteras Island. This nesting female crawled over the main dune, crossed Highway 12, and headed towards um, a, a house that had bright um, lights over its porch. Um, fortunately, the, the Park Service um, saw the crawl of the turtle going up over the dune and didn't see it coming back, so they went to investigate it, and they found it before she started to go back across Highway 12 so they could stop traffic and she wouldn't get hit. Um, fortunately, they were able to get her back to the water. Um, again, you know, lighting lighting is a huge issue um, in our state. This this is just a picture of what Atlantic Beach looks like at night if you're standing at the at the at the high tide line looking inland. You know that you can just see uh, a wall of lights there. And if if there's a nesting female or hatchlings that emerge from the nest and they're trying to find the brightest spot they're going to go in that direction away from the water uh, and that can lead to problems. You know, they're more exposed to land predators if they're up longer on the beach. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, on the beach or um, if they're there still when the sun comes up, they can become desiccated, especially hatchlings or in the worst case scenario, the hatchlings end up on the road and then they end up getting run over. This is this happens every year. We get reports of hatchlings that get run over. Um, inadvertently, but but it happens because they're attracted to street lamps um, uh, by, by roads that are close to the beach. So we don't have a statewide, um, we don't have a statewide lighting ordinance uh, for, for our coastal um, areas. Different municipalities do have some ordinances uh, with different levels of, of efficacy. Um, it would be nice if we had a statewide ordinance that that um, helped with this issue, uh, but it, it's quite tricky because there are, people feel really strongly about the security aspects of having light at night. Um, so it is really a thorny issue that we're still trying to trying to do something about. So that was the that was the nesting component of our project. We also have the stranding network. Um, again, so you know, strandings stranded turtles can occur anywhere along the ocean side, but they also, we get lots of turtles that occur in our estuarine waters, and we have over 15,000 kilometers of estuarine shoreline, as well as oceanic shoreline, where sick, dead, or injured turtles might end up stranding. So uh, it's quite it's quite a lot of area to keep track of, and, and as I said, that this is really good foraging habitat for turtles in here. Um, especially loggerheads, Kemp's Ridleys, and green turtles. So we see them quite commonly in our, our estuarine areas as well as the ocean side. And we, we un, unlike the uh, more um, exciting nest uh, component of our program where people like to see hatchlings, um, we have a smaller but still enthusiastic group of people that are still keen to go out and investigate sick or dead turtles. So, so here's a typical scene that we might get a call about a dead turtle that, that's washed up somewhere. And so um, not all of our volunteers are keen to go respond to dead turtles, but we still have a, a, a good number that will do that for us. 
and we try to keep track of every single stranded turtle that shows up because um, we want to learn more about things like you know, when they're here, what size class is here, um, what some of the, you know, why, why are they sick, injured, or dead, um, that can teach us more about threats. And, and they collect, the, these responders collect um, standardized uh, data fields for us. Um, actually, you know, we're part of the nation, the National Stranding Network, um, and we, we submit all our data to the, the National Stranding Coordinator's Office in Florida. So we all, everyone on the East Coast of the US collect the same type of data when they respond to stranded turtles. And we'll also collect samples for any researchers that are interested in specific projects, whether it's something about uh, potentially microplastics and sea turtle GI tracts or collecting bones for studying growth, things like that. Uh, it's not just dead turtles. We respond to sick and injured turtles. Uh, um, typically, we see um, you know, turtles that, are, that either are hit by boats, potentially, or sometimes they're entangled in fishing gear. Uh, this is just an example of a turtle um, from, I think it was 1993 or four. Um, that was accidentally hooked by a, a surf caster. The turtle ate the bait, got the hook down, down into its esophagus. Our, one of our volunteers responded, helped get the hook out. She put a, a tag on it and released it. And in fact, it was seen again 10 years later nesting on a nesting beach in Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico. So that was pretty exciting. Um, so yes, we also try to tag any, any sick or injured turtles that do get released in the end. These are just, this is the annual number of stranded turtles that occur in North Carolina. And, and similar to the nesting num numbers, the annual stranding numbers also fluctuate year to year. Um, you know, it looked like there was an increase over time up to 2000 and then a decrease. We think this is related to changes in, in um, fisheries management, this one. Um, we had a huge, two, or sorry, we had two big peaks here in 2010, 2016. These are actually years when we had very strong um, cold fronts come through in January after warm, following a pretty warm run up to winter. And we had a lot of hypothermic turtles or cold stun turtles show up in those years. And in 2020, we had 802 uh, stranded turtles show up in North Carolina, which, which is more than average, but uh, it seemed like a pretty typical year to us. What are the causes of strandings in North Carolina? Well, I alluded to some of them, so it could be boat strikes. So this is a telltale pattern of the, of a, you know, a, a cut from a propeller on the carapace of a loggerhead turtle. Um, sometimes it's not always easy to tell if the boat strike occurred before or after the turtle was dead. Um, it could be the case that that some turtles might have been sick or or dead from for some other reason and then hit by a boat. Um, but what we think, sorry, we know that on average 12% um, of our of stranded turtles are stranded because it's it's due to boat strikes. 5% uh, more or less on average is due to entanglement, whether it's through fishing line, um, gill nets, pound nets, things like that. Disease, uh, it's it's hard sometimes to know exactly when a turtle is diseased, although this in this case, this turtle is quite thin, covered in barnacles. Um, this, this fits our criteria for disease. Um, we get a fair number of cold stun turtles that show up. Um, these are otherwise healthy an animals that just, are, you know, they're um, and it following a big uh, cold front that moves through, they, they end up washing up on our beaches. But I'd say, or, or based on our data, it's you know roughly 50% of the turtles that show up, we're unable to classify cause final cause of death. We can often rule out causes of death, so we can rule out things like boat strike or you know clear, visible signs of entanglement or cold stuns. But we can't always clearly assign cause of death in in almost half the cases of stranded turtles in North Carolina. Some of the big threats that we see in North Carolina, well, one of them is is bycatch. Um, th this is this is a little bit of a, a cheat photo. Th this is a um, 
loggerhead juvenile turtle being taken out of a pound net. Uh, pound nets are just big fishing traps in North Carolina that um, turtles like to go in because they know that there's food in there. In fact, many times fishermen report taking turtles, dumping them over the side, and then the turtles go right back in because um, they want to eat more. And actually, this is this is a pretty low impact gear uh, for sea turtles. Most of the turtles are still alive. You know, 99% of the turtles are still alive and are are released um, just fine. But there are other types of gear that are problematic. Um, specifically, gill nets are a big issue in North Carolina um, because if turtles get caught in a gill net, they usually end up being stuck underwater and they can't rise to the surface to breathe. Um, there, there have been changes in the way that gillnet fisheries are managed in North Carolina to help reduce impacts to sea turtles. And this is just one example. This is a restricted area, this kind of half um, rect rectangle in gray here. This is the deep water gillnet restricted area in course and Pamlico Sound, excuse me. That's so basically this area is closed to all large mesh gillnets. Um, from September to December. And, and that's pretty much the only time that that gear would be used in this area. So basically it's nobody can fish there. And that's because based on historical information about bycatch of sea turtles um, caused by gill nets. Th there are other um, area closures related to gill nets in other parts of, of Pamlico Sound and Albemarle Sound and, and Core Sound and Back Sound and things like that. Um, that, that have been uh, useful in trying to reduce the overall, overall mortality of sea turtles caused by that uh, fishing gear. And it, it has been pretty successful to date, I think. Um, that's commercial fisheries. Uh, we, we also have issues with uh, recreational gear. So we talked about that, that Kemp's Ridley that got caught in the 90s and was seen nesting again later. Um, we actually, every year we get um, dozens of reports of Kemp's Ridleys that are accidentally captured either on fishing piers or through surf casting. Here's a, a juvenile Kemp's Ridley trying to go after some bait. Um, there are so many um, saltwater anglers in North Carolina that it's really hard to know what the overall impact of sea turtle interactions with that gear is. Not everybody reports it when they get a sea turtle. Sometimes the line just snaps and they're not even, they don't even know that they've caught a turtle. Um, so it's, it's hard to know exactly what the overall impact is. But there's other types of recreational gear too besides hook and line. There are people that use um, gill nets as recreational gear. People use trawls as recreational gear, shrimp trawls. Um, uh, crab pots can sometimes have interactions if they accident, if turtles accidentally get stuck in the buoy line. Um, so there are all there are many different types of gear that we, we just haven't got a very good handle on what the overall impacts are on sea turtles. Um, sometimes when turtles do get hooked, uh, deeply hooked, it, it becomes more of a challenge and we might take them um, to, to our to veterinarians that, that work with us through NC State, uh, especially down here in Moorhead City, there's an NC State uh, veterinary lab at the CMAS building in Moorhead City and, and the, the, the vets there are great and they work closely with us. Um, and, and oftentimes what they'll do is they'll, they'll take a radiograph or an x-ray just to make sure after they've gotten the first hook out to see if there's anything else in there. And sometimes we see these repeat offender turtles that seem to like to go after bait and they will sometimes have ingested two, three, four, five different hooks in them. Oftentimes, if the hooks are small enough, they'll pass through, although occasionally sometimes um, the hooks don't pass through. They become um, uh, stuck somewhere and, and surgery might be needed uh, to, to remove those hooks, uh, which is sometimes the case. Again, I'd say most often um, hook and line captures do not result in mortality, although we don't know what the long-term impacts are. There could be delayed mortality impacts that we just don't know about. There are other things in the water that, that cause problems. So here's a, a hopper dredge. These, these are the dredges that work off our coast to try to remove uh, silt and sand that might be stuck in some of our harbors or our um, port channels. 
or they're used for renourishment projects. And it's basically a giant vacuum head that sucks up sand and puts it into the hopper in the boat before it can be delivered to the beach or wherever it's being delivered. And you can see it's so big that it could easily suck up a turtle. Um, there are things you can do to try to minimize the impacts, but they still occur. And in fact, um, just last month, there were two uh, takes of sea turtles by hopper dredge in Moorhead City, um, despite all the, the mitigation actions that were undertaken. And then the last big threat um, is an interesting one, um, hypothermia or cold stuns. Again, we have a lot, you know, our, our estuarine waters are really good foraging habitat for green turtles, Kemp's Ridleys, loggerheads. Um, but it seems like we have an abundance, an overabundance of green turtles that occur in our waters. And, and normally they leave uh, when the water temperature starts to go down, they'll leave through the inlets and, and go out to the Gulf Stream or move south down to Florida and then come back in the spring. But sometimes, you know, it, it, in, if we have a particularly warm December, the turtles don't get the message, they don't leave, and then we'll have a cold snap in January. And the, the water levels in our sounds are so shallow that the water level, the water temperatures can change very quickly. And these turtles are, are ectotherms, so they, you know, if it gets too cold, they'll stop swimming and then the water, water currents or the air uh, um, winds will just blow them up onto, onto the beach. And sometimes we'll collect dozens, hundreds, if not thousands of turtles. In 2016, we had almost 2000 cold stun turtles show up in a month, which was something else. So we rely heavily again on our volunteers to go out and pick them up. Um, and, and usually they're in pretty good shape and they can be turned around quickly and released. Um, usually, not always. Uh, that does point to the fact that we do have uh, dedicated rehab centers in North Carolina. We have one private one in Surf City. It's the Karen Beasley um, Sea Turtle um, Rescue and um, Recovery Center. Um, it's, all, it's all privately run, um, self-sustaining. Uh, and you can go visit in the summer. Uh, I think they've just recently opened with various COVID-19 protocols. Um, the North Carolina Aquariums also help out. They have one dedicated rehab center in Manteo at the Manteo Aquarium. And then the other aquarium, so this is actually Pine Knoll Shores Aquarium pictured on the right. They will sometimes um, set up te um, temporary pools to help out with if we've had lots of cold stuns come in. And, and the personnel that work in, work in these facilities are pretty good and they've helped to release over 2000 turtles to date um, that have been sick or injured, which is great. So um, I just wanted to tell you one thing that we are working on. Um, if, if you look at the US recovery plan and you look at the criteria for loggerheads, what it's gonna take to get them off the endangered species list, you'll see that the number of nests in North Carolina have to reach 2,000. So we did we did reach that one year, but th this is, they have to reach that on a, on a regular basis. And that number of nests must be a result in a corresponding increase in the number of nesting females. So you need to, you need to know not only the number of nests, but you need to know how many times each female nests. And I, I didn't tell you, but I should have told you that um, for the sea turtles that occur here and, and in most places, uh, when they nest in the summer, they'll lay several nests in a, in a particular season. So uh, if a female is nesting in the summer, she'll on average, she'll lay something like four to seven nests um, separated by about two weeks. And, and then she'll take a year or two off after that, that nesting season. But we need to know um, if there's an increase in the nest numbers, we need to know that it's actually a, a metric of the increase in number of females and not just that it's the same number of females laying just more nests per female. So for instance, if you, if you look at this graph, it looks like the numbers are increasing, number of nests are increasing here, but how do we know that this represents an actual increase in females? We need to know what the clutch frequency is. We need to know how many nests are laid by each female. So how do you do that? So you could do nighttime patrols, send people out on every square foot of the 
of the state and do marker capture tagging, but it's really tough. Um, people would quit probably after two weeks and I, and, and I, I would quit after two weeks myself. Uh, you could do satellite tracking, so you put a satellite tag on. This is a female that's got a satellite tag that was placed on her uh, on Bald Head Island, and then you could follow her, and you could you could tell when she comes out of the water for two or three hours um, at night in a particular place that you would know that that she had nested, and you could follow her during the season. But it's pretty expensive. It's somewhere in the range of five thousand dollars per turtle, uh, and you'd have to catch them. Again, you'd have to go out at night all night to catch them, so that that's not going to work to get a population wide um, estimate of clutch frequency. So our, our approach was to try to get a DNA sample from every female every time she nests, not by going out and, and sampling her when she's nesting, but indirectly sampling her by taking one egg out of her nest, out of every nest that's laid, take one egg, uh, discard the contents, keep the shell because the shell will have small um, a small number of the mother's cells that get stuck in there when the eggshell is laid down in the oviduct. So it's it's kind of like taking a cheek swab from the female. And you're taking just one egg out of 120. That's the average uh, clutch size. So we've been doing this for um, 10 years now. And uh, we use microsatellite panels that that gives us high high level of specificity for individuals, so we can get a very specific genetic ID, and we can tell them apart for sure. We won't confuse sisters or mother mother daughters or aunts nieces. We'll be able to tell them all apart. We won't be able to tell um, twins apart, uh, but but we think twinning is pretty rare. And, and this is just what uh, we have found uh, over the past 10 years. We, we, the data for 2020 aren't ready yet, but you can see that the number of nests on average per female changes. It does change every year. So in 2010, it was 2.7 nests laid per female, even though the range is one, one to eight. Mac, you know, we had one female lay eight nests and some lay just one. On average, it's 2.7. We've had some years go as high as 3.5, some years as low as, as 2.7, but this variation is not enough to explain this increase. So we know based on that information, we know that this truly represents an increase in the number of females, which is a good thing. And we think it reflects um, long-term uh, benefits to early actions back actually in the 80s and the early 90s of protecting nests, protecting females, making changes to fisheries regulations, things like that. And then I just wanted to show you some of the interesting, um, we, because we have the DNA of individual females, we can actually see where they nest over time. So this is an individual loggerhead turtle number 3887. She nested in four different years, 2010, 13, 16, and 19, and she was very faithful. She stuck to one part of Bogue Banks, pretty much Pine Mill Shores. She did jump over to Atlantic Beach a little bit, but pretty much stayed within an eight kilometer range, which is kind of what, what we all learned in our textbooks about sea turtles being very faithful to a nesting, nesting location. This is another turtle, 8360, showing a similar pattern, nesting in three different years. A, a little bit wider extent, 45 kilometers between this nest and this nest, but mostly staying on Hatteras Island over those three years. But we do get about 20 to 25 percent of our turtles wander a bit more. So this is in individual 12117. This is just for one year, 2019. So she started down here in South Carolina, second nest, northern South Carolina. Third nest was Pea Island. Fourth nest was near Wilmington on Masonboro Island. And then fifth nest back up in Pea Island. So this whole, the, the range from here to here is almost 600 kilometers. She was not very faithful. Although she did seem to prefer Pea Island in the end. Uh, this is this is the, our longest distance one to date. Uh, this was from um, 2019, so she first, this female, which is 12432, first nested uh, in the northern Outer Banks near the Virginia border in end of May. About two weeks later, she nested in Florida, northern Florida. 
and then another two weeks, and that's almost a thousand kilometers. And then another two weeks later, she was back up in North Carolina again, nesting in Fort Fisher. We don't understand why it's to her benefit to make those kinds of long distance um, dispersals. It's unclear, um, but it's interesting. Uh, and yes, this this second one was five. So this first one was almost a thousand. This was over. This one was over 500 kilometers from Florida to Wilmington. So the minimum amount she she moved in that um, month period was over 50, or about 1500 kilometers. And then the last thing I just want to tell you about is we also can see related relationship patterns through the genetic work, and we were we've been able to identify mother daughter pairs, and we have a what we call a super mom. So this is turtle three nine one two. She likes to net. She's her most recent nest um, was on North Topsail Beach. She likes to, to nest in North Topsail Beach. She has eight daughters currently nesting as well. Of, of those eight, five are nesting kind of nearby. Three others are nesting in South Carolina. And uh, of those eight daughters nesting, uh, they all came from eight different fathers. Um, but that's, I've gone way too long, so I, I'm just going to wrap it up and thank you for listening. And I'm going to go back now to see if anybody has any questions. Great. Thank you so much. That was super interesting. Um, Sorry so, I went too long. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> um, I think we do have a question. OK. So Wilson Laney, if you would like to turn on your mic. Hey, Matt, so um, I'll give you the option of, well, I'll, I'll ask this one in a way to uh, hopefully cause you to answer it. So would you care to speculate as to why North Carolina does not have a joint enforcement agreement? And if memory serves me correctly, we are like the only state on the uh, eastern seaboard that doesn't have a joint enforcement agreement in place. I believe you're correct that we are the only, I think we're the only state east or west coast that does Could not be. have a joint enforcement agreement. And I think it's a historic, it's an, an historical issue that the uh, commercial fisheries and, and just commercial fisheries uh, representatives were not interested in having an extra layer of federal oversight, which they felt that represented and had pretty good lobbyists working in our state uh, at, at the state level, convincing our lawmakers not, not to go for it. Uh, it is my understanding that things have changed a bit and there's more interest in trying to get a joint enforcement agreement with National Marine Fisheries so that it may end up happening actually. Um, I think our Division of Marine Fisheries, our state agency responsible for managing fisheries would like it uh, because it also involves the transfer of funds uh, and would help with them with their enforcement issues as well. So I, I, th I think there's interest in it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if it happens. Yeah, thank, thank you. I know it's been uh, proposed uh, multiple years and thus far we haven't managed to achieve success. Thank yes. you. Yes, yes. Maybe, maybe I'm overly optimistic this time. <laughs> So just a reminder, if you do have any questions, then you can um, raise your hand and just feel free to um, turn on your microphone and ask a question. And it looks like, Wilson, you have another one, so you can go ahead. Well, hey, if nobody else is going to ask any, I'll, I'll fire it up and ask some more. Um, so, so Matt, just a tremendous presentation. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for all of those thousands of volunteers out there that make it possible as well. Uh, uh, citizen scientists are so very important and uh, I know uh, you couldn't produce all of the really cool science that you do were it not for all of those citizen scientist volunteers out there. So do you think, um, I, this this one is a difficult one, I, one that I've thought about a lot. Um, 
you know, the more successful we are, the higher the level of bycatch. At least that's my perception. So uh, have you and our other sea turtle conservation experts thought, you know, long term about what's the best way to try and address that? And, and I know that there are some folks out there, some of our colleagues that wear scientist hats, uh, even advocate, you know, for a return to uh, some level of sea turtle harvest for consumption. So what are your thoughts on that whole thorny issue? That, that's a great question, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, the better the better we are at protecting them and producing more turtles, the more we're going to have and the more issues we're going to have. Um, I mean, we see that right now, not not just with, with commercial fisheries, we see that uh, with nesting, you know, having turtles net so many nests now on our beaches that that we're, ha we're starting to have um, you know, issues with people wanting to do more act activities on the beaches, more construction, things like that, that that's bumping up against, um, you know, our, our rules and regulations for protecting sea turtles. So I, I think you're right. I think we have to start thinking about a better way or, or how we're going to change as their numbers increase. Um, I, I worry about, though, I think we're sometimes we are we're too quick, you know, we're always on or we're always off that I think we're going to have to be a bit more nuanced when we cut when we start to make changes because it'll because they're slow growing and their populations take so long to recover that if we do something, if we if we relax protection measures too much that there could be a pretty rapid decline in the population and that would force us to reinstitute very restrictive measures again. So, you know, I don't want to see that up and down kind of thing. I'd rather see a more nuanced approach where we have some restrictions. Geez, I, I think I feel like I'm talking about COVID-19 that, you know, we can't just all take our masks off. We have to, you know, gent gently move towards a better, better approaches that that are more flexible. I agree, um, but it can't just be on or off, I don't think at this point. But I, I think you're absolutely right. I think I think it's a huge issue that I don't think we are by we I mean the sea turtle people. I don't think we have thought very carefully about how to manage this because we are running into a situation where we have lots and lots of turtles. Okay, we have a few other hands up. I don't know who wants to go next. Sam or Gail, did you have questions? You can just turn off your mic. Yeah, um, I have a question. So I know um, that the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission recently has been posting a lot of things about certain types of lights uh, and how that could affect sea turtles. Um, and since we spent such a good time today in the discussion, thank you, by the way, for putting that together, discussing about how lights can be a huge impact. I understand why some counties in North Carolina, especially when it comes to residential safety, I get that. But I know, is there anything that you know of so far that has like, because uh, I know in Florida, they're doing like more red or orange lights to try to help the turtles out. Is there anything like that happening in North Carolina? That, that's a great question. Um, th there are a few municipalities that have instituted uh, lighting ordinances for the for the benefit of sea turtles. Um, let's see, I think Pinal Shores here in Carter County, all, all town owns lights have to be not visible on the beach. And I think, I think Holden Beach recently instituted it's it's a volunteer program, but they help offset the cost of in of using yellow or red lights if people want to install them. So yes, so turtles um, they are they are much more interested or they're more attracted to white lights, less attracted to yellow and orange, and not attracted at all to red. 
Um, there's this funny thing with yellow light and loggerhead turtles. For some reason, loggerhead turtles hate yellow light and will actually go away from it. Um, so they're xanthophobic. And so um, Florida allows people to use yellow lights, even though they have a, a statewide lighting ordinance there. They allow people to use yellow lights um, as long as they abide by the rules and regulations of the lighting um, um, ordinance. Uh, they can install yellow lights, which will help keep the loggerheads from crawling towards them, actually make them crawl away. Uh, the, the issue is, though, that um, not only loggerheads nest in Florida, so they have other species that nest there, and those other species are still attracted to the yellow light. So it's, it's a little bit... Uh, it's a little bit complicated and in fact the the florida ordinance doesn't allow even with yellow light you can't have any visible light visible on the beach so basically even if you install so-called turtle friendly lights they still can't be visible from the beach during the nesting season so that that would be great if we could do something like that here in north carolina that would be that would be fantastic um but it's it I've been in several meetings over the years with different different um, lawmakers and representatives, and it's been really tough to even get the conversation going. Thank but you. Great so Thank you. Dean Carpenter and I still are interested in working with you to do a uh, sea turtle monitoring plan and also a sea turtle uh, status and trends assessment for the app. Out in that, uh, geographic area, so we'll we'll talk to you sometime offline about that. That that would be great. And actually, um, Noah is is working on critical habitat designation for green turtles. Oh uh, yeah, good. I forgot about that. Yeah, and they're super interested in in green turtles in and around the um, Pamlico Sound area. So yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just say uh, the green turtle dovetails nicely with the APNEP uh, foci right now, which are water quality and submerged aquatic vegetation. Uh, we're probably going to use blue crab as our first uh, aquatic faunal indicator species, but green turtles would be a great one also. Great. Anne, did you have a question? Yes, uh, we just discovered Oak Island for the first time and had a ball down there last week, just learning photographing pelicans and all. But I also, it was the first time I'd seen the use of Christmas trees. And uh, we were talking about how that, the two pictures you showed, how they were too close together and it was you know kind of a hampering to the turtle nesting. What um, What is a way to, use that same to build up the dunes, but not interfere with the turtle set. The ones at Oak Island seem to be more staggered than the two pictures you all showed. Yes, and and um, that's a great, great point. And I, I should have mentioned that um, for every problem beach, there are, there are probably two or three good good beaches that, that do the right thing. So essentially, if, if you follow the same guidelines for sand fencing, which is, as you say, stagger them, leave lots of space, I think it's 10 feet feet between um, each line of sand fencing or each line of Christmas trees to allow turtles to get in and out. Uh, and then don't have the, the line, if you line up Christmas trees in one row, don't have, don't have it longer than, I think it's 12 feet or something like that. So yes, there, there are ways to do it that are more turtle friendly and, and towns have followed that guidance, um, but there are some that that haven't, and I, and I don't think it's because they're they're trying to harm turtles. I think it's just that they don't understand or or they're not um, they haven't seen the guidelines that are available. So so we do rely heavily on our volunteers actually to keep an eye out on things like that, and that's actually how we heard about both the Nags Head issue and the Topsail Topsail Island issue is because our volunteers were like, hey, this, this doesn't look right. Do you know anything about this? That was fascinating how one really good idea could cause problems in inadvertently in another area. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if Gail, do you think Gail was able to manage getting on? 
It looks like maybe his computer is frozen. Okay. <laughs> Did I anyone like ask the question? question? Yeah, okay. I like the question that you asked earlier, actually, um, about if people want to see the hashlings coming out, um, when and where, and if people want to see sea turtle nesting, when and where would they go, and when would that happen? Thanks right. for the great question, Brianna. <laughs> Right, it is a good question. So you you saw in the the graph that you know nesting is from May until August. Although the peak is end of June, early July, so maybe four week period between um, say June fifteenth and July fifteenth. That's your peak nesting, and then in North Carolina, and then peak hatching would be sometime fifteen August to fifteen September. Um, more nests are laid the further south you go, so you would want to probably go to Brunswick County. So Oak Island, someone mentioned Oak Island, that would be a good place to go, or Bald Head Island as well. Um, most of the beach beaches there have volunteer programs and educational programs, and you can even try uh, looking for their Facebook. I'm sure they have Facebook sites and things like that. You can You can reach out to them to see if they have programs or if they have walks things like that. Um, but honestly, when, when people ask me or say that they really have to see a nesting female, they really have to see a hatchling, I say your best bet is to go to Florida, uh, go to Melbourne Beach, which is east of Orlando, and they have super high density nesting in the summer there. It's actually hard to walk on the beach at night because there are so many turtles there, and there's so many hatchlings, you know, two months later that that's that's where you should go to see if you really want to see turtles go there that that's a tremendous recommendation matt and I, paul tritek who at the time was the refuge manager at archie Carr, took me out one night and i think we saw eight in one night so yeah, yeah. it's much the higher there's much higher probability of encounter down there yep that's actually where I went and saw the turtles nesting. And I think we saw four in one night in an hour or so at the Archie Car Park. So, yep, that's a great place. All right, does anyone have any other questions? If not, I guess we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. And yeah, thank you, Brianna, for, for hosting. And Tara, thanks for, as always, for tech support there. <laughs> All right. Okay. Have a great night. Great. Nice seeing everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.